policy, which I've been an honor to be a part of. And with leaders like this from all over the nation, uh, our account, parts of the Council of National Policy. And uh, uh, Bob, uh, now I'm honored to get to know him, uh, is a man of courage, a man that has much more organizational skills than I do. Turn that thing off, it is like it's an auctioneer, okay? Nope, it's not here. I think it's going to work. Hey, hold on, no, no, thank you, sir. Okay, good. Well, uh, I'm the attacking America. What they've done is they've taken people, Americans, off the ships. And this little country says they don't put up with that. And so we were at a war against the strongest nation in the history of the world. Just to give you an idea, they boycotted America, and they put over 600 ships along the eastern <coughs> seaboard to keep us from functioning. The United States Navy at this moment has 284 ships. Right on my mouth. You think they can't hear me? Is that, yeah, is, that's why they haven't left yet. I understand. Okay. <laughs> and so, just to give you an idea, so, so Dolly Madison, who was the first lady to be called the first lady, was preparing lunch for James Madison, the first president to command, the last president to command troops in the field. They were going to have a conference. And uh, as she was fixing lunch there, a messenger came running in and said that President Madison was not coming to lunch, but the British were. And with that, they grabbed the tea set that had been left by James and Abigail Adams. There was a new painting done by Gilbert Stewart on the wall of George Washington. They tore it, tore it down, rolled it up, and then there had been a picture of Dolly that had just arrived, and they took that too. Ran out the front door, hopped in and took off. The British came in the back door, came in, ate the lunch, and then enjoyed the day, and then that night put it to the torch and burned the city of Washington to the ground, destroying every, every building in the place except two, the four stone walls of the White House and the four stone walls of the Capitol. Years later, they made a resolution you cannot build any wooden buildings in Washington, D.C. anymore in case somebody came back to burn it down. But when they did that, they then began to march. They destroyed the government of the United States. The government of the United States records were then destroyed. We have nothing else from that. The Library of Congress was ruined. It was reestablished thereafter. They bought Thomas Jefferson's library and started up again. But the entire government was wiped away. Now there's only one step left. And that is to knock out the military. The, the fourth largest city and the second largest seaport was Baltimore, 40 miles north. And so they began to march north to Baltimore to take over that city as well. Americans, loving freedom, independent sorts. When they came marching through Upper Marlboro, Maryland, they came out to Heckerlin, calling the names that they thought of these foreigners coming in to take over their country. Wasn't much the British could do, they couldn't kill everybody. And so what they did was they stole the doctor from Upper Morgan, or a fellow by the name of James, Dr. James Bean. And they took him with them because military always need, they always need uh, medics. Now, just as an aside, it appears to me I'm yelling. Are you sure it has to be this? All right, fine. I'll proceed. And so when they got to, when they got to Baltimore, there was a a fort there, a name for McNair, uh, McHenry. McHenry had rescued the flag. It's a little ironic. During the Revolutionary War, in the battle, Saratoga, and they went over and they named this fort, protecting the entrance to Baltimore after him. A young fella in his about 31 years old, a, a, a colonel, knew that if the British were going to overtake America, they would have to come through him, and they'd have to come through Fort McHenry, and he was now the commander. And so he took his own money, and went out to a, a woman in Mrs. Speakersville, and asked she and her daughter to make a flag of the United States, a banner, if you would. There were 15 states, and so there were 15 flags, and 15, 15 stars, and 15 stripes. That made it 30 feet high and 42 feet long. Each one was 2 feet by 2 feet. The stars were 2 feet, the stripes were 2 feet. $402. He kept it for the day in which the battle might come. The people of Upper Marlboro went to Washington to find the water. They got Francis Scott Key. He lived in a little home there, a two room home with his 14 children. And uh, 
uh, places now called Key Ridge, where you come across Key Ridge into Washington, the house is right there. And uh, they petitioned him to try to get their doctor back. Well, Americans can't negotiate with foreign powers, and so they went to see President Madison, who's living out of a place that's now Belmont Country Club. And uh, they approached him and he said, and he agreed, and so he said, well, take Colonel Skinner here with you, and he'll represent the United States government and negotiate and see if you can get Dr. Arnold. And so they did. They rode out to the command ship at Conant, who was outside the city of Baltimore there, and they petitioned and asked them for the doctor. And they played with him all day long and told him that they didn't want to. And what Colonel Skinner did was go around to the ship and ask people if Dr. Bean had helped them. And they wrote little notes of saying how did this American doctor, Americans respect life, how did they had helped them. And, and at the end of the day, he dumped all those letters on the commander's ship and said, we'd like to have him back. And they said, all right, fine, you can have him. Because tomorrow, your country doesn't exist. We've already wiped out the government. When we finish taking out the military, this war will be over, and there'll be no United States of America. So I don't care. But you're going to stay on the ship tonight because we're going to take over this fortress. And that night, as the sun began to set, they began a bombardment of Fort McKinley. Now, the reason that they had to begin the bombardment was because Americans, not Army, not Navy, not Marines, just God fearing, freedom loving Americans had taken 22 of their own ships and taken them out and sunk them in the entrance to the harbor. <clears throat> they couldn't get in. And they had, but they had this new invention called, called a concrete rocket, which had a timer on it. And when you, would, when you would send it up, the timer was such that it wouldn't explode until it landed and then it would do its damage. So you didn't have to just keep hitting the wall over and over. It would be an explosive. It was a, a new invention. But the timers weren't real good. And they would often go off long before they ever landed. And so that night, they began the bombardment. Hour after hour, hundreds and hundreds of shots at Fort McHenry, in which the commander, who had said the flag was established for just this time, put that sucker up there where they can see it, so they'll know where to aim. And they did. And all night long, they shot it. About 1.30 in the morning, everything went quiet. And Dr. Bean, Francis, Carlton, Francis Scott Key, and Colonel Skinner were nervous as to what happened. Did their country still exist? They didn't know what happened. And so when the sun began to come up, he began to write, Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we had hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars, or the ramparts we watched, were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets wrecked there, the bombs bursting in there, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave? Or the land of the free and the home of the brave. He didn't know if there was a country left or not. What he didn't realize was that what had happened at 1.30 in the morning was that the British had begun the land of salt. For all of us, those in the Navy, we appreciate the fact that no one can get to a war unless the Navy helps them do it. And then they have the, the artillery that prepares the way. We no longer use cannons like we used to. We use the Air Force. But, but then there comes a time when you have to put one foot in front of the other if this is ever going to be over, and that's when the Army marches step by step by step. And so after the artillery had been done, and now took time for the army to land, when they started to march through the marsh in order to get to Baltimore, those same Americans, not Army, Navy, Air Force, just God-fearing, freedom-loving Americans were laying in the bushes with them and waited, and when they began the, the assault, they stood up, and the cost was so heavy that the British ordered a retreat, and America survived. And so... That next morning, they wrote into the Queen Anne Hotel, wrote four more verses, the last one being this, thinking of those of us here today. It said, Oh, thus be it ever, that free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war of desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may this heaven-rescued land praise the power 
that is made and preserved as a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause is just. Let this be our motto. In God is our trust. Amen. And the Star Spangled Banner. And the Star Spangled Banner in triumph will wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the world. And that little country, that little country, wooden buckle in there, has blessed and prospered the world like no other nation on earth. We don't have flags that have coats of arms of wealthy and powerful people. We have a flag that's made up of the red, white, and blue that represents the United States of America. We don't have a scepter. We don't have a king's crown. We have a flag. And the flag represents who we are. We pledge allegiance to the flag because it represents who we are as a nation. And when you take a knee, when you have consent, when you spit on the flag, you're spitting on what America is. So don't pretend like it, well, they have the right to speak and you shouldn't be able to. Yes, we do have the right. Don't tell me, if you walk up to my mother and spit my eye, I did that, I spit on your mother because I'm in favor of world peace. I don't care what your story, your family, your group. You spit in my mother's eye and I don't like it. And when you tear down my flag, don't tell me you're doing it for the cause of some justice or injustice anywhere else. You know what you're doing. You're using the symbol of my country and showing it contempt for it. And I have every right to speak up against it. Yeah. Why don't they like this country? 4% of the population of the world call themselves Americans. 4%. Every year, that's 4%. Right? More books, more plays, more symphonies, more copyrights, more inventions than the other 96% combined. The question is why? Half of all the people on earth live on less than two dollars a day. Half of those, that'd be a fourth, live on less than one dollar a day. The second greatest spot on earth is Western Europe, France, Germany, Britain. In America, we have a level below which we will not permit a person to sink. You come to this country, sit down on a park bench, drive a complaint off the country, we will bury you. There's chance for food, a roof over your head, a bed sleeping, unlimited health care for you and anybody you've ever met, unlimited education. A person living in poverty in America. <coughs> Record study, Heritage Foundation, Wall Street Journal, and every 24 months for the past 37 years. A person living in poverty in America is more likely to have a telephone a television, an air conditioner, an automobile. Now just stick with me. Jesus talked to 5,000 men plus the women and children without a microphone. You can hear me. <laughs> a person living in poverty in America is more likely to have a telephone, <laughs> I, I, is that me? I've got to tell you a story. I know exactly where I am. I'm going to come back. But I've got to tell you a story. I was at dinner about three weeks ago with members of Parliament in London. And they told the story of what one of the fellows there that was being inducted as a member of the Privy Council. The Privy Council is the handful of people that surround the king and as council, king or queen. And they're the only people on earth that are allowed to touch the sovereign voluntarily. That's how intimate they are. You're not allowed, you don't reach up, you don't ask. Unless she reaches out to take your hand, you don't, you don't touch the queen. But the Privy Council can't, they're the most intimate. She was taking in a new member of the Privy Council about six months ago. And everybody was there in the regalia, and when the British know how to put on the show, and they all had their uniforms on. And when the fella came forward, it's, you know, you get down on your knee, when you're being knighted, you use a sword on each shoulder. But you merely, she reaches, he reaches up and takes her hand, and that's the way you become a member of the Privy Council. He comes up, he kneels down, and right when he does, his phone goes off. <laughs> and every, everybody in the room starts to snicker. And the queen said this. She said, maybe you should answer that. That might be somebody important. <laughs> I just love that. Here's where I was. Second richest spot on earth, Western Europe. The question is why? Now, it's important we know the answer to that question. Unless we elect people who want to fundamentally change America, there's no place else for us to go. Let's 
keep it up. We love to talk about poverty. We, if we want to talk about poverty, we'll take, go to the Ozarks and have people sitting on the porch, take black and white pictures and say, it is war value. The sixth largest nation on earth. 200 million people. The gross domestic product, the goods and services created by the sixth largest nation on earth, combined is smaller than the state of Arkansas. The fourth largest nation on earth, same size as the United States, Indonesia, largest Muslim nation on earth, 300 million people, it's the place Barack Obama grew up. The GDP, as a member of OPEC, or this is all, the gross domestic product of the fourth largest nation on earth, cause of free enterprise. Let me explain. Young people do not understand what socialism is. They don't understand what they're talking about when they talk about, let's try it. If there's a car going down the street out here, there's only two ways that I can get money out of that car. Number one is called free enterprise. That's where I lay awake nights, figuring out ways how to do something good for that person, such that they slam the brakes fully and say, oh, you're going to watch my car. I've got the carpeting, dust, and the dashboard, big windows. I would much rather have that than have this $10 bill. Oh, well, I'd much rather have that pair of shoes than have this $50. A global position, and I'll never get lost again. This is good. I'd much rather have that than have this $200. You only become wealthy by blessing another person. And here's the significance. The greater the blessing, the greater the contribution, the greater the reward. Such that, in America, for thousands of years, people focused on day five. It was Americans that invented the airplane, and the light bulb, and the telegraph, and the telephone. Put men in the moon. You put a little GPS on, up, on, on, on your animals. If a 10-year-old in Warsaw loses her puppy dog, she can get an iPad and go on the internet. And through the GPS find where her puppy dog is, all of it conceived, invented, maintained by Americans. Why this place? Free enterprise rewards people who bless others. Now, I said that there were two ways to get money out of that person's pocket. One is, I do them, they come and they make a voluntary exchange, in which at the end of the exchange, we are both better off, we have created wealth. The only other way is just to take coercion. So we stop the person at the street light, we sit around, put a gun in the window, say we want half of everything that you've got. Who does that? A criminal does that. Or the government has a gun and does the same thing. Here's the significance. Stick with me. The impact is the same. So you get you go to the pay window, you walk across the parking lot, go to your car, a fellow comes up with a gun in your grip, says I'm 50% of everything you've ever produced. You sit down with your wife and children, you say, This is how much money we have for food, clothing, and shelter, the kind of vacation we can get, the kind of car we can drive, or you make it all the way to the truck, you open it up, you see Uncle Sam's already in there. Half of it's already gone. The impact is the same. So the principle is this: the greater the freedom, the less money they take away from you. The more choices you have, the more freedom you have, the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. The more a criminal, the more a government takes away from you, your lower standard of living, less freedom, less choices. And that's what politics is all about. If you understand that principle, you can make any rich place poor, or any poor place rich. You show me what percentage of the gross domestic product of any city, or any state, or any nation. And that's all politics is. The richest city in the world, in the history of mankind, when you and I were young, was a place called Detroit, Michigan. Not close, by the way. About 18%, about a fifth, richer than any place else in the world. They elected a bunch of Democrats in the late 50s, said, we can put a stop to this, and they did. <laughs> and now it's the poorest city north of the Rio Grande. And what happens when you... If you come to an intersection, every time you come to that intersection, people are surrounded by cars, they're coming away from you. How long before you quit going through the intersection? And so the population of Detroit is lower than it was in 1900. There are 39,000 single family dwellings in the city of Detroit that are not uninhabitable. They're uninhabited. Uninhabited and uninhabitable. But Cleveland's not far behind. They do. Democrats can do this any place, they're doing it for the state of California. And so the question is, freedom. The lower the cost of government, the greater the freedom. And any nation can then be restored. You and I remember, late 1970s, gas lines, 
18% inflation, 22% interest rates. And what do liberals tell us when they screw things up? They say, well, that's just the future. That's the way it is. The head of the Council of Economic Advisors for Jimmy Carter said in 1980, he said, the question is not whether or not America will have a declining standard of living in the 1980s. The question is whether or not Americans can learn to adapt to their decline. They always say there's no way out of it. The reason everything's out of it is just because that's the way that the world is. Well, Reagan came along and said, nonsense. He said, there's nothing wrong in this country that proper leadership can't do. And so what did he do? He came in and cut the cost of government. Immediately people began to say, you have to produce. Get this, three out of every four jobs created on this planet in the 1980s was created in one country, the United States of America. The country is supposed to be finished. Wash up, wear your sweater, ride your bicycle. America's coming to an end next Tuesday a week. Didn't anything anybody? You remember, Jimmy. Well, we now have just come to the same thing. We've gone for a decade of no growth at all. Just the same, a flat line, 1% growth in the economy. And they said, well, that's the way it is. That's the new, that no, new normal. That's the new normal for them because they can't. They'll screw up a two car fuel. They don't know how to run. So they come along and say, that's what America's future is. But America could say, oh no, 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 that's ain't complicated. We're going to go ahead and we're going to cut taxes. And you know what happened? When we cut the taxes, what does that do? Now, let me explain. For young people, let me explain why this is. When Reagan came in, the federal taxes on money was 70%. Now, the local taxes in Ohio is 9%, 9 to 79. And you've got a local city, it's two or three. So that means that if you go out and earn something, or you risk it, and you invest it, and you hit, and you're successful, the government's going to take 83 cents of it, or 17 cents, but you can also lose it. And so in that case, what do you do? Nothing. You're not going to do the risk. And so, when Reagan cut taxes from 70% down to 35, plus 10 with the additional, now you're up to 50% taxes, so it's uh, 80 cents now, if you hit, you get the least they keep half of it. And so people began to invest and we began to create jobs. This isn't rocket science. If you've ever run a lemonade stand, you understand it. You have to be a PhD to not see it. It's simple for normal people. <laughs> so the same thing with Reagan, with, with Trump. When we cut the taxes, over a trillion dollars abroad has come to be reinvested in the United States. When he became president 18, 19, 20 months ago, the United States, the tax on business was the highest in the world. The highest in the world, 35%. It's 15 in Canada. So it's more than twice as high. And so factors went elsewhere. We cut it down to, to 21. We're now in the bottom fourth of the world. And jobs are being created. Let me give you a couple of facts. 6 million, 700,000 new manufacturing jobs. Oil and gas. Since 1975, America has been prohibited from selling oil abroad. Don't ask me to explain why. That's dumb as suppose. And we elected this guy from New York or thought so. He said, why don't we, instead of us giving them money, and then they use the money to pack us, why don't we, instead of buying them, their oil, why don't they buy oil from us? So we began selling oil for the very first time. This year, America is selling oil Second largest producer in the world. Next year, we will be the number one exporter of oil on the planet. Leadership makes a difference. <clears throat> the, the tariffs, in which, how do you negotiate? Do you say pretty please, or you belly up? There is a 20% tax, a tariff, on American cars that go to Europe. And so, Donald Trump said, if you think that's a good number, we'll apply it to your cars. Liz and I were in, in Brussels at the Euro European Union three weeks ago. The topic of consideration was the fact that, get this, the German Automobile Manufacturers Association, that's BMW, Volkswagen, Mercedes, they were petitioning the European Union to lower the tariff on American cars coming to the European Union to zero. Now why did they do that? Because we send pretty these cards? So we send flowers at Christmas? No. He said, because we're going to do that to you. And you know, now it takes the European Union a decade to do anything. You know they've already reacted and have offered to lower taxes on American cars coming to Europe to zero. And you know what Donald Trump said? I'm not sure. <laughs> 
Now why? Because he knows that that's all Germany makes. They make cars. And you put 20% increase on the price of every BMW, they're hurting. And so before he gives away that hook, he knows that he agrees to that right off the bat. And when he comes back to the way they're treating military uh, uh, medical supplies and the other things that they're doing, that they'll, they'll have to push it off. And so he's like, oh, just, we'll just wait here. Isn't it great to have an adult that knows how to walk into it? Yeah. 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 Ten minutes down through, I promise. Oops. Strength of a nation is four things. Economic, I've talked about that and I could go on for much more. Military, let's focus on that. The day that Donald Trump became president, the U.S. Army was smaller than it was on December 7, 1941. Weakness invites aggression. The reason that the Japanese attacked? Okay. Admiral Thomas Moore, a good friend of mine, who became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was in charge of the interrogation of the Japanese High Command after World War II. He says they interrogated these guys individually. All of them gave the same answer, which means that the, well, it was the truthful answer. They said, how did you feel you could attack America with impunity? They all gave back his name three things. Number one, that the Congress of the United States had passed the Selected Service draft by only one vote, which means it was not supported by the people. Number two, they had just completed military training in Louisiana using cardboard tanks and wooden guns. So there were not enough guns for the people in the military. You can, you can Google this and you'll be able to see it. They have a big cardboard and draws tank on it. That's, that's the way they did maneuvers. And they, and thirdly, we had voted to not fortify Wake and Guam Island lest it be provocative to the Japanese. And they saw the weakness in this America and they determined that America, when presented with a fait accompli, when the Navy was destroyed in one day at Pearl Harbor, the United States had either the will nor the capacity to respond. America's army was the 17th largest in the world, smaller than Romania. The army last January was smaller than it was then. The Navy is currently smaller than it was under Teddy Roosevelt prior to World War I, and the Air Force is smaller than it was on the day it was created. So under John McCain, as chairman of the Armed Services Committee, and Barack Obama, his partner in the White House, the military has been so weakened that we needed a president to resort, and he's in the process of doing it very, very rapidly. The South China Sea, in which the Chinese, 70% of all maritime trade comes up through the South China Sea, including 100% of the oil for, for Japan. Japan has no oil, fourth largest economy in the world. They're completely dependent on American tech. The Chinese have begun to fortify that, and they said the other day that they were starving. They were able to take over these islands and put military bases, and America didn't do anything about it under Barack Obama. This president now has said, okay, China, we're on a, a new game here. That is, when you're, when you're doing this thing, you know that the stock market in Beijing is down a third for the day they need to cost us. The stock market in America is up a fourth. That means people, our money that has been for the last 20 years going out from our small towns to New York and over to China is now no longer doing that, and China is now willing to cooperate. I think we want to explain a little bit more about North Korea now, sir. Let's go to the final point, and that is leadership, which you understand. And that is where judges come in. Four out of five evangelical believers in America that voted for Barack Obama or voted for Donald Trump said they did so because they were concerned about what was happening in the courts. They're it's out in the middle of the Mojave Desert in 1919, a company of World War I veterans, young boys in their 20s, put a cross. And the names of the members of their company that were lost in the war in World War I. Now, you've never seen it, and you could never find it. There are no roads to go to it. It's in the middle of nowhere. It takes a four-wheel to ever come even close to it. But the ACLU found it and said that it was inappropriate to have a cross on this World War I display. It made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court voted five to four. Who were the four? Two appointed by Barack Obama, two appointed by Bill Clinton. They voted five to four and said this, that any religious symbol, not speech, not presentation, not doing what we did here today, any religious symbol on any public property 
is a violation of the Constitution of the United States. That means they, are, they were one vote away. One more vote. And you would have had to take a sandblaster to every courthouse in America, to every school yard, to every other. I can do the same thing with, with, with guns, the possession of guns. We were on the precipice of losing our country. Gave us somebody with the backbone to appoint judges that are going to stand up and do that. And our opponent, the enemy, has taken note. And we are involved in a spiritual battle That's right. in which they are willing to do anything to destroy a person who stands for what America stands for the lighthouse for the gospel in the world. Right. And so, what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to vote, to do everything we possibly can to elect the right people to positions of responsibility, and to pray for those in authority. I don't believe that there are two or three Donald Trumps hanging in the wind. I think this is our chance to save America. And it's doing it with a vengeance that the battle is worth the fight. This country has been entrusted to us, and who, including now, who, who has to do it? It was Christmas Day, 1776. A handful of people had gotten together, and they had established a principle, an idea. Nobody had ever done this before. It wasn't the strongest nation on earth with the greatest history that invented the light bulb. This is an idea that said this, that because God made a person, that God had given that person rights. And among those are life, anybody wants to tell you now, I don't want to be involved in that. I'm just doing the mother and the woman and the doctor. You're in the wrong country, honey. Because in America, it says that to secure these rights, the purpose of the United States government is to secure life, then liberty. Notice the sequence. Liberty is a precious little value if you're dead. You have to have <laughs> life first, then liberty, then sewer systems and overpasses. But the first thing you do is life. And that idea attracted people, and 45,000 patriots began to fight the strongest nation in the history of the world. They didn't have a single battle, a successful battle. They got beat, they got killed. They got sick, and they deserted, and now it's down to December 24th, 1776. There were 7,000 men laying around in the snow because they didn't have facilities, and they're laying there freezing to death. Little girls would come along and sell them sandwiches and things, and then report back to the British condition and the, the quality of the, of, the, of the opposition. George Washington sent a note to his cousin at Mount Vernon and said, I fear this thing is about up. Because on January 1st, the enlistments were up. And the only reason they're laying around their hang around is because they've come this far, and if they quit now, they won't get paid anything. But if they hang on until January 1st, they can all quit, and everybody knows it. George Washington's prayer partner, Dr. Benjamin Rush, founded the American Bible Society, came down and they had a prayer time. And they came up with this suggestion. What we're going to do is go down six miles and cross the Delaware River and three miles down and attack Trenton, where there is an encampment of British soldiers, actually Hessians, that were hired for that purpose and have unlimited supplies of money and men and material and ammunition and all the things that we don't have. And we're going to do that on Christmas Day and ask God's blessing. For if we don't, our country will never be born. And so, Benjamin Rush suggested that the, the theme should be, the password will be victory or death. This is it. The same day, a fellow by the name of Thomas Paine wrote a, a piece in which he described this. It's a little bit longer than this, but George Washington recognized its significance. And so he said, how many of you can stand? Of the, of the 7,000, only 2,500 of them can stand. 
He had a march to stand up there on December 24th. This was written on the 23rd. He had a branch of his group that said this. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. He that stands with it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. For tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheaply, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives a thing its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. It would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. And so, George Washington asked these patriots who are going to go to battle against the most sophisticated soldiers in the world. These are professional soldiers. And they agreed to do it. And then George Washington, the reason I said all this is to say this. Then George Washington said this to this aide de camp, Alexander Hamilton, 19 years old. He said, post none but Americans on guard tonight. You know, what, what do you mean? They've all got birth certificates. Does that make you American? They all got birth They got the uniform? No, 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 no. Being an American is spiritual. You and I can't become Japanese or Chinese, but anybody can become American because an American spirit is what you stand for, what you believe in. You believe that there is a God and that God created us and our life and our liberty comes from Him. And if you don't believe that, you're not an American, according to George Washington. So when you say to some of these folks that say, we're not a Christian nation, and all these sort of, they, they, I don't care if they live in the White House. That doesn't make them an American. George Washington said, post none but Americans on guard tonight. And so they began to march. And it would be wonderful if when you did things, the Lord would make it easy for you. But there's no record of that ever happening in Scripture. We've always had to struggle. We've always had to battle. It's never been the majority. The Lord said, Why don't you just hang in here and just stay awake? And nobody would do that. He was left all to himself. And so these men began to march. Their, feet, their shoes began to fall apart. They said you could, they wrapped them in burlap. They said you could follow the soldiers by the blood in the street. They went down, instead of crossing the Delaware at night and attacking them in the morning, by 8 o'clock the next morning, they were halfway across. It took them all day to get across. They had to attack them broad daylight at noon. And they did. And God gave them a victory. Not a single one was killed. 22 of the enemy was killed. 89 of them were wounded. 876 were captured. They got all of the supplies of the ammunition and, and the food and the rest of the supplies. The euphoria that struck up and down the coast was such that soldiers by the thousands enlisted in America became free because one man led and they understand what had to be done because they were Americans. That They didn't have any place to look over their shoulder and operate a country. They just had an idea and a love of freedom. Well, that is now our responsibility. That has now been entrusted to us. Oh, thus be it ever that free men shall stand. And I'll conclude by saying this. Let's just cut to the chase. I, I got involved in politics for two reasons. I love America and I hate communism. And Ronald Reagan and I had a lot in common. He was very generous to me. I was able to participate in the first communist country elected with a non-communist leader. We knew that they were going to kill him, but this thing was going to fall apart. I was able to escort him into the, into the chancellery in Warsaw, Poland. The next week we did the same thing in Hungary. Nine weeks later, the wall came down. I was the only American in the Kremlin the day the Soviet Union dissolved. And so I, I, I got involved in politics because I love this great country and I hated its enemies. And let me just tell you, in the fight that we've had with all of these things, I am now, more optimistic than I have ever, ever been. The problems with America all stem from what we've allowed the courts to do. We were asleep at it for 50 years. We were going to church saying, bless me, my wife left on his wife, I swore no more, amen. Well, they're out there stealing the country blind. Now we've begun to wake up and they realize that everything that bothers you about America, the homeless people are sleeping on grapes. For 200 years we never did that. We had a poorhouse. We took care of people. Only the socialists, only the leftists, only the liberals would come along and say, if a person is not a threat to society, it's better to throw them out on the brakes and let them urinate on themselves and things. Everything that aggravates you, the fact that 
that you have to put magnetometers in the schools so that people don't steal things and people don't bring guns because they took thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal off of the walls in the school. They did it to be able to pray. All, all, of it, all of it comes from the courts. But you know what? They, they did a lot of things to slavery. And, you know, Democrats remember this bad since they took their slaves away from them. You understand why they're so <laughs> we, But we, we, we changed that. And we can now begin to re litigate those things. Just because you made a foolish mistake in 1962 doesn't mean we can't fix it. What do we need? We need good judges. What do you do? How do you get good judges? You have to get a president with a backbone to do it. Yep. And you know what? We've got it. This has never been. I have never been more excited about our nation's future. Is it going to be easy? Of course not. Satan never gives up a fight. He's going to kick and scream and scream and carry on. You saw what they did in that committee here. You know what? You know that's the way they are. You know what they're like. But we're going to stand together. And this lighthouse for the gospel. Let me just tell you, I'm, in three weeks I'm going to, to Budapest to speak for the Prime Minister of the National Prayer Breakfast. So in 2006, 2016, I spoke at nine presidential prayer breakfasts in every country, in nine different countries. When they had the prayer breakfast, the parliamentarians and, and, and the, the leadership, the administration, and the, and the diplomats, they all prayed. And they only prayed for two things, every country. They prayed for their own, in Ukraine, they prayed about the war that's going on since they've been invaded by the, by the Russians and for their cousins and their grandparents are behind the curtain and they can't, send, they can't go visit them and they can't protect them, they know they're ill and they're praying that God will bring resolution. And they prayed for the leadership of the United States of America. The entire world knows that there will only be freedom if America is free and there's nothing they can do about it except pray. And for us, we have the capacity and the right take control in the vote. And I believe the future is brighter than it's ever been. No wonder they're so upset. They, they were this close from finishing this country off, and God pulled us back from the brink. And of course they're distraught. They're kicked that Supreme Court a, an entire generation away. And this is going to be our time to claim victory. God bless. Yeah.